Welcome to the C.S. Lewis Foundation's webinar series. This is our uh, maybe seventh or eighth webinar and in, um, in uh, collaboration with the C.S. Lewis College. We are delighted that you're here today for our conversation with Jack Redford. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Dr. and Mrs. G. Wesley Vick III, Preservation of Elegance, and Joshua George. So I'm Amber Saladin. I'm the Arts and Ministry Director for the C.S. Lewis Foundation, and I'll be guiding us through our conversation today. Perhaps this is your first time joining the C.S. Lewis Foundation. You are very welcome. We are a community of mere Christians. We are inspired by the life and work of C.S. Lewis to seek out and cultivate faith, reason, and imagination in the company of friends. We come from a variety of backgrounds, education levels, denominations, ages, and experience, but we are united by our common love of Christ. Our, webin our webinar series started during COVID as a way to continue to meet together and to be encouraged. We're so we're thankful for this technology which joins us together today. We've talked with some amazing speakers over the last nine months and are continuing to plan both in-person events in 2021 and 2022 and uh, continue with our webinar um, internet-based speakers in the future. So let me pray for us as we start today. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for uh, this technology which joins us together even though we continue to be separated. Um, we are thankful for our wonderful friendship with friends who are close to us in proximity and those far away, even today from Germany and from Alaska. We're thankful for our friend Jack and his uh, time with us today. We pray that you would use this hour to inspire us by the presence of your Holy Spirit, to inspire us uh, in our reading, to inspire us in our creativity, and to inspire us to follow you more closely and more dearly. Amen. So today, our main event is our guest, uh, the composer and arranger, orchestrator and conductor, Jack Redford. So Jack's gonna join me on screen here at some point while I tell you a little bit about him. Now I've known Jack now for maybe 15 years and I keep forgetting what an amazing man, I mean, I, I always know what an amazing man he is, but I keep forgetting all of the amazing things he's done in his life. Jack's music has been performed by artists and ensembles such as the Academy of St. Martin's in the Fields, the violinist Joshua Bell, the Chicago Symphony, the Israel Philharmonic, the Los Angeles Chamber Singers and Master Chorale, the New York Philharmonic and the Utah Symphony. Jack's music has been featured on programs at the Kennedy Center in DC, the Lincoln Center in New York, Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and London's Royal Albert Hall. Most recently, um, he composed the Raymond W. Brock Memorial Commission for the American Choral Directors Association, a piece called Homing, which I was um, blessed to be in attendance for the premiere of that piece. Collaborating with other artists, Jack has orchestrated and arranged and conducted for Academy of Winning Composers he worked with James Horner, a name which many of you will know, for 18 years. He's worked with Alan Menken, Randy Newman, and Rachel Portman, and has spent the majority of his time uh, since 2008 working with Thomas Newman, uh, a very famous and talented composer. Uh, you'll recognize his work with the Bond films. Jack's worked on the scores for Wally, The Amazing Spider-Man, Skyfall, and he orchestrated and conducted Adele's Oscar-winning title song for Skyfall. He's written arrangements for Joshua Bell, for Anne Echo Myers, and has written and recorded with other Grammy-winning artists such as Stephen Curtis Chapman, Placido Domingo, Bonnie Raitt, and Sting. That's fun. I didn't realize Sting. <laughs> uh, Jack uh, makes most of his music uh, most of his money, spends a lot of his time working in Hollywood, arranging and conducting scores, but he is a choral nerd. And you can find his, um, some of the pieces that he has loved the most 
um, our piece is written for the voice. And uh, there's, he has great, um, his website, which I go to actually often because there's a couple pieces that I always have my children's choir sing or my, or my church choir sing. So you can find his music uh, on his website, jackredford.com. Jack, there's still so much more to say about you, but I think it's time for us to <laughs> let you speak for yourself. Hello. Hi. Hi. It's great to be here. <laughs> so Jack is going to tell us, tell us why you chose this topic, Jack, because we wanted to talk to you about all sorts of things, but why music in Narnia? Well, I love the Chronicles of Narnia. I love Lewis as an author. I've read most of his work and, and most of it multiple times. I've read Chronicles many times. And I just, being a musician, I just, on my last read, I went through it and I thought, I, I would like to uh, separate out these, all these references to music because it seems like there's a lot of them and I've never noticed it before in terms of a group. And so I just kind of went through the books and I underlined everything that had to do with music, split it off, kind of started to take a look at it. And, and I realized that it was kind of a rich uh, store of material there. So um, you know, this is the fruit of that observation. Um, it's still kind of in flux in terms of me just still learning about what it all means, but uh, something I wanted to share. I, I just felt like this was a good environment to be able to share that, have a conversation about it with you guys. Great. Thanks so much, Jack. So I'm going to go off screen. Jack's going to tell us what he's learned. I'm going to read this. Uh, so forgive me if I look off to the side where my notes are. Um, <clears throat> This is, this is essentially the written portion of the program and I'm, and I'm going to read it and then we'll go on with our conversation after that. So music is probably not the first thing that comes to mind for most readers of C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. For many, it would not be the second or the third thing. I have been a professional music, a musician since high school as well as a long-term reader and rereader of The Chronicles. And I would not have said that music played a truly central role in the series until I decided to make a study of its special references to music and to look more intentionally at the way music is used where they occur. I approached my study from the perspective of one who has made a career of music in films. For more than 44 years, I've been grappling firsthand with the challenges and satisfactions of combining music with images. I believe this gives me some insight into the marriage of music with other art forms, not only the closely related visual ones, such as dance and theater, but also literary forms like poetry and novels. I've come to the conclusion that the use of music in the Chronicles has much in common with its use in film. The meeting where a composer and a director decide where to place the music in a film, and specifically to a hundredth of a second, where it should start and end, is called a spotting session. That term derives from picking the spots for the musical cues. I have participated in hundreds of spotting sessions over the years, so it was quite natural for me to spot the Chronicles of Narnia in order to find out how the music had been used. There are a few definable ways to describe the uses of music in a film. Source music, for example, is the term identifying music for which the source is visible on screen. The Narnian corollary would be Tumnus with his flute in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or the Mayanads with their flutes and cymbals in Prince Caspian. Implied source refers to music from an off-screen, unseen source. Think of the dwarf drums heard from afar in the last battle. Underscore is the term used to describe music for which there is no objective source, either visible or implied. It is an abstract aesthetic addition a comment which may heighten the emotion or give atmosphere to a scene. So you've got these three types of music, source music, implied source music, and underscore. It's nearly impossible to imagine the use of music as underscore in a written narrative. Aslan's song, his founding Narnia and the magician's nephew comes about as close to achieving the character of underscore as any text could. I'm gonna quote it here. Polly was finding the song more and more interesting because she thought she was beginning to see the connection between the music and the things that were happening. When a line of dark firs sprang up on a ridge about a hundred yards away, she felt that they were connected with a series of deep prolonged notes, which the lion had sung a second before. And when he burst into a rapid series of lighter notes, 
she was not surprised to see primroses suddenly appearing in every direction. Close quote. One of the cinema's most brilliant and unique composers, Bernard Herrmann, had this to say about the importance of music to the emotional impact of a scene. Music on the screen can seek out and intensify the inner thoughts of the characters. It can invest a scene with terror, grandeur, gaiety, or misery. It can propel narrative swiftly forward or slow it down. It often lifts mere dialogue into the realm of poetry. Finally, it is the communicating link between the screen and the audience, reaching out and enveloping all into one single experience." Close quote. C.S. Lewis seems to have understand, understood something very like the emotional relationship of music to screen with respect to his stories. The witch with her mandolin in the silver chair certainly invests that scene with a palpable misery and terror. And the singing birds at Aslan's table in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader creates a breathtaking sense of grandeur. For gaiety, we need look no further than the aforementioned Mayanads or the great snow dance in the silver chair. Lewis was also well aware of how important atmosphere is to a story, a point to which Michael Ward alerts us in Planet Narnia. Quote, again and again, in defending works of romance, Lewis argues that it is the quality or tone of the whole story that is its main attraction. The invented world of romance is conceived with this kind of qualitative richness because romancers feel the real world itself to be cryptic, significant, full of voices in the mystery of life. Lovers of romance go back and back to such stories in the same way that we go back to a fruit for its taste, to an air for what? For its itself, for a region for its whole atmosphere to Donegal for its Donegality and London for its Londonness. It is notoriously difficult to put these tastes into words." Close quote. One can hardly imagine Ramandu's island without its song or the cursed world of Charn without its bell. That's atmosphere. Yet there is another way in which music may be married to a scene. When the music overtly gives form or shape to a scene, serves as the very bones on which that scene is built, or provides the central recurring and unifying voice for it, I call it a set piece. According to Merriam-Webster, a set piece is a composition as in literature, art, or music, executed in a fixed or ideal form, often with studied artistry and brilliant effect. Thus a set piece is like a song in a work of musical theater. That music is central rather than ancillary to the moment. In my estimation, there are 11 set pieces in the Chronicles, one each in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and The Last Battle, three in Prince Caspian, three in The Silver Chair, and two in The Magician's Nephew. Some of these set pieces go on for pages and pages of text, and some take up multiple chapters. In film, multiple and varied uses of music may be employed in the construction of a single set piece. So it is with Lewis's stories, in fact, all of the Narnia examples I mentioned above were drawn from what I would call set pieces. The set pieces in the Chronicles are as follows in order of the book's publications. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Tumnus plays a tune on a strange little flute that made Lucy want to cry and laugh and dance and go to sleep all at the same time. The first set piece in Prince Caspian centers around the sounding of Queen Susan's horn. We learn eventually that this event actually sets the whole story in motion. The second is the scene where Lucy is awakened and dances with, dances with the trees before encountering Aslan. The third set piece is the glorious romp with Bacchus, Silenus, and the Mayanads, a scene I can scarcely read without tears. The voyage of the Dawn Treader lands us on an island where the fallen star, Ramandu, and his daughter begin a song which is taken up daily at sunrise by the large white birds ferrying the feast to Aslan's table. The silver chair provides a spine tingling set piece featuring the witch, queen of Underland, attempting to seduce and subdue Eustace, Jill and Puddleglum with a trance inducing mandolin performance. The next set piece, its polar opposite, is an exceedingly cheerful and rowdy snow dance that greets Jill on her exit from the underworld. The death and resurrection of Caspian is one of the loveliest, holiest moments in the series, 
the funeral portion of which is accompanied by wailing strings and disconsolate blowing of horns, playing a tune to break your heart. Notably, this doleful music stops the instant King Caspian is transformed. Sometimes ending the music is as effective as starting it. The Horse and His Boy is the only book without a scene that I would define as a musical set piece, even though it has some significant examples of source music, several of them involving the horns of Tashban. In The Magician's Nephew, the Bell of Charn and the Founding of Narnia provide the lengthy and evocative set pieces. The Bell of Charn is described as giving out, quote, a note, a sweet note, such as you might have expected and not very loud. But instead of dying away again, it went on, and as it went on, it grew louder. Before a minute had passed, it was twice as loud as it, is, as, it is, as it had been to begin with. It was soon so loud that if the children had tried to speak, but they weren't thinking of speaking now, they were just standing there with their mouths open, they would not have heard one another. Very soon it was so loud that they could not have heard one another even by shouting, and still it grew, all on one note, a continuous sweet sound though the sweetness had something horrible about it, till all the air in that great room was throbbing with it and, by, and they could feel the stone floor trembling under their feet." Close quote. By contrast, Aslan's song that creates Narnia begins like this, quote, a voice had begun to sing. It was very far away and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once, Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth herself. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune, but it was beyond comparison the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful, he could hardly bear it." Close quote. The set piece in the last battle is created by the ongoing sequence of dwarf or calamine drums which bind several scenes together in a formal unity. Apart from the set pieces, Lewis has draws on a wide palette of musical knowledge and practices throughout the Chronicles. There are 106 references to musicians, musical instruments, music education, or the sound of music in the stories. Prince Caspian was taught how to shoot the bow and play on the recorder in the Theorbo and Prince Kor must learn reading and writing and heraldry and dancing and history and music in order to become wise and civilized adults. Caspian later demonstrates the influence of his training when he confronts the corrupt Gumpus saying, I believe I understand the slave trade from within quite as well as your sufficiency. And I do not see that it brings into the islands meat or bread or beer or wine or timber or cabbages or books or instruments of music or horses or armor or anything else worth having. The musical instruments Lewis mentions in the books include all of the major instrument groups of the symphony orchestra. Woodwinds, including flutes and pipes, brass, including trumpets and horns, percussion, such as drums, bells, cymbals and gongs, and strings, fiddles, mandolin, and the theorbo, which is a kind of a lute-like instrument. Music in nature is referenced in 22 scenes incorporating bird song, the music of the hounds, the queer, lilting, rustling, cool, merry noise of trees, and the chattering of water over stone. There are 17 spots with references to dancing and 20 to singing, including one to Eustace whistling. There are in fact far more references to dancing than there are to poetry, which is interesting given that Lewis was a poet and not a dancer, at least as far as we know. Poetry is mentioned, of course, and I include its eight instances in this study for two reasons. First, because Erato was, after all, a muse for both music and poetry. And secondarily, because Reepicheep is specifically described as singing softly in his little chirruping voice, the song the dryad had made for him. This song is also called a verse and a prophecy in the voyage of the Don Treader. Courtly music is mentioned at 11 locations in the books. One of my favorite instances is from The Horse and His Boy, where we are told that, quote, the wine flowed and tales were told and jokes were cracked and then silence was made and the king's poet with two fiddlers stepped out into the middle of the circle. Erebus and Kor prepared themselves to be bored. 
for the only poetry they knew was the Calamine kind, and you know now what that was like. But at the very first scrape of the fiddles, a rocket seemed to go up inside their heads, and the poet sang of the great old lay of fair Olven, and how he fought the giant pyre and turned him into stone and won the Lady Liln for his bride. And when it was over, they wished it was going to begin again. What composer doesn't hope for that response? The benevolent influence of music is mentioned several times in passages like this one, where the name of Aslan, Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. That music may have a malign influence as well has already been noted in reference to the Queen of Underland and the Bell of Charm. The voice of Aslan has its own quality of blessing as demonstrated in the creation of Narnia where every drop of blood tingled in the children's bodies when the deepest, wildest voice they had ever heard was saying, Narnia, 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 awake, love, think, speak, be walking trees, be talking beasts, be divine waters. But Uncle Andrew was not able to enjoy this experience. When the lion had first begun singing long ago when it was still quite dark, he had realized that the noise was a song and he had disliked the song very much. It made him think and feel things he did not want to think and feel. So in Aslan's words, he made himself unable to hear my voice. Let's not be like Uncle Andrew. Before closing, I want to say that having done this study with the Chronicles of Narnia makes me long all the more for musical studies of Lewis's other writings, as well as the works of his fellow inkling, J.R.R. Tolkien, which features music in so abundantly rich and moving ways. The comparisons and contrasts between these two authors and their stories is more than we can tackle with any real depth in this conversation, but I will wander happily in those meadows if you wish. Thanks so much for listening and let's talk. Oh, thank you, Jack. What a, what a wealth of information there that many of us haven't necessarily given some thought to. Friends, if you have not heard of Jack's collaboration with Malcolm Geit and Bruce Herman, you need to go, Chris, can you put this in the chat, OrdinarySaints.com. It's called Ordinary Saints. And it's a beautiful collaboration with these three of our friends, um, portraits painted by Bruce Herman, poetry about the people in the portraits or their experience um, uh, by Malcolm Geit. Some of the poetry is a, his own experience about what it was like having his portrait painted. And Jack set all that to music. And uh, the title Ordinary Saints is about, uh, thanks Chris, those of us who are ordinary and yet the Lord makes us saints. So that's something special, which I didn't even think about until just now. Jack, what is it about music that impacts us so much? Why, why do we have all these feelings when we hear music or think about music or even, even just reading about music in Narnia um, inspires us? What is that? Well, I, I, I think it's because there's something elemental about, about music um, it's a different kind of communication than words. And so it bypasses some of the, some of the uh, verbal barriers that we can erect uh, between us and, um, and revelation of things, either through nature or, through, or from God himself. Um, and, and so it gets inside of us in a particular way. I mean, we talk about the transcendentals. We talk about um, goodness, beauty, and truth. Mm -hmm. And truth is mediated a lot through words and goodness through actions, but music operates in the world of beauty. That's its domain. And we have forgotten how immediate beauty can be in opening up a glimpse of the divine uh, to us. But we don't forget when we're actually taken over by it, when we listen to a piece of music that it becomes the conduit for God to communicate with, with us in that way. It then becomes very present, very immediate. The Im imminence of God is, is so palpable during that experience. So um, I think that um, beauty has kind of come in for some suspicion uh, because of the nature of our cultural, uh, our cultural moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do believe that it's a, a particular way for, for 
for, for us to be reached uh, by God in ways that bypass some of the ordinary barriers that we erect, you know? So it's, I think that's one of the reasons why it affects us so deeply. Yeah, yeah. My children were just listening to a podcast about why monkeys don't respond to music. <laughs> and so there was a, this is an NPR podcast for children. So we were in this discussion about, about uh, how being created in the image of God gives us uh, yearnings and desires that we don't see in other parts of creation, although those parts are good. Yeah, music embodies Zainzukti. It's the, it's practically an embodiment of it. And it's, you know, here's another reason why it affects us. One of the few things we know about heaven is that there will be music and singing. I mean, we don't know a lot of details about it, but we do know that. So yes. it, it reaches out to us through the veil, you know, when we hear music. Yeah, that's as a musician, my, I'm married to a pastor and I like to joke with him that he has to find a new job in heaven, that they'll, that the, <laughs> No more preaching, <laughs> but I'll get to keep mine, <laughs> 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 which I look forward to, you know, never playing wrong notes. Sounds like a great oh, plan. Oh, yeah, love that. <laughs> yeah, who, who's going to get the Marriage Supper of the Lamb gig, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so as a composer, uh, when you're thinking about music, um, what sort of Im emotional impact, like why do we, why do we include music? in a film or a story? Like, uh, what, what is that about our desire? Um, talk to me about the emotional impact of music in a film. That quote from Bernard Herrmann really kind of lays out some of those, the dimensions, the one I included in my presentation. Uh, he talks about how film essentially is a set of two dimensional flickering images mm -hmm. that pass by our vision, you know, just one after another in rapid succession, they give the sense of motion, but in reality, they're a series of still photographs that we're looking very quickly at. Um, and um, so he, he talks about how music reaches out across that, that abyss between flickering images and our hearts. Yeah. Um, I mean, other things do that, the performances of the actors, we get to see their faces, we get to see their, their movements, you know, so there are a lot of things that do it, but music has a special quality in, in, in connecting with our hearts across that, that sort of suspension of the suspension bridge of disbelief, you might say, <laughs> to, to, reach, to reach us directly, to help us to be able to uh, empathize with and live vicariously through the lives of the people that we're watching. Yeah, yeah. So when we were chatting uh, a few weeks back, you said something which I thought fascinating. Um, and maybe I wondered if you thought more about it. You said, the music I hear when I read Narnia is unlike anything I've ever written or anything I've ever heard. What does it sound like? If I could describe it, I'd be able to write it. I, I, I don't know. I can't tell. Um, I've, had, I've had friends describe what they felt was music from the other side, you know? Um, and I've asked them to tr tell me, you know, what it, what it sounds like, and, and they're not able to really put it into words. And when I, when I read these passages, it excites my imagination, but it doesn't excite it with, I, I don't think I would be able to put it in, into music um, of, of, that I wrote. Is it, is it tonality? Or is it the instruments that are available? Not, not the instruments that are available. Okay. Um, I don't think that, that if, if there is music, you know, well, since there is music on the other side, I don't think it's gonna be anything less than what we have. I don't think there won't be violins, but there might be other things. That's a fun idea. Our, our very bodies might vibrate um, and create uh, sound waves, you know, in ways that they don't now. We certainly have parts of our bodies that do that. We have vocal cords. And then we have strings, you know, that vibrate in order to create, and columns of air, you know, that that um, vibrate, and and that's what we have in our instruments right now. So I don't think that there'll any, be anything less than that. I mean, that's one of the great things about the the Christian doctrine of the resurrection is that we don't imagine this sort of airy, gnostic, non-material afterlife. Right. Our bodies will still be there, you know, and 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 there will be there'll be. 
a new kind of body, you know, that will not be held back by some of the things that hold us back here. So it's not gonna be less than what we have. It'll be more so. Yeah. Talk to me about the human body being an instrument. Because as a, as a singer, as a music director, I, I have feelings about these things, but th th what does that look like from your perspective? How is our body an instrument? Well, the easiest thing about it is our bodies are instruments when we sing, because, because we literally have to produce the sound with our bodies. And, you know, anytime anybody does any warm ups in a choir, you do all kinds of calisthenics, you know, they're speci specific to singers, you know, it's stuff that you do to get your body loose and, and ready to produce these sounds. You have to do that or else you can be all, all closed up and tight and not able to sing your best, you know, so our bodies participate really uh, in a focused way, you know, to sing. But if you think about what it takes to play an instrument, the muscle memory that it takes to play the piano or to play a, a violin or to, play, or to play a brass instrument, just to work valves or to work the slide, um, these are all things that involve our bodies and the muscles of our bodies. So um, music is, is not, this is one of the, actually one of the complaints I have with synthetic uh, producers of music, um, mm. synthesizers, synthesizers, computers and so forth is that it takes our bodies out of the experience of actually making the music. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think there's a danger in that. You know, I think, I think we lose something really important. And one of the worst things about the pandemic for me has been not being able to stand next to somebody to sing. It's not, and it's not even enough to stand six feet away from them and wear a mask and sing. You really, in order to really sing, you've got to be standing next to somebody and you're, the air has to come out and commingle and your voices have to commingle and blend. And, you know, that, that is the experience of making music. It's something that is inherently a community experience, yes. um, not an alone experience. Oh, I resonate so deeply with all of that. <laughs> and this, se this season where we have not been able to sing together. So hard. been a long, long Lent, but, but also highlight so much our need, our, our, um, just our desire as Christians for this experience. Yeah, it's one of the blessings that you can derive from a hard experience like this is all the things you took for granted. I, I literally, I was able to reschedule my second vaccine injection this morning for this morning. Uh, and so I went in this morning to get it and drove back. And as I was driving back, I saw a crowd of people gathered on a soccer field with their children playing soccer and I just burst into tears. I haven't seen that for more than a year, yeah. well more than a year. Yeah. And it just, I, just the beauty of that smote my heart. <laughs> yes, what I have not yet experienced is a whole room of people singing together. Nor have I, yeah, and I so look forward, I crave that day. I, I also crave it. And I worry that we've lost something about that, that I think a lot about how can I encourage people to practice singing, especially if they haven't sung in a year so that they're ready for that day. So friends, that's, this is a, a yeah. plea from two musicians is <laughs> practice singing at home so that when you show up at church, you're ready to go and you're ready to add your voice to that amazing throng we'll have to give each other we'll have to give each other grace i mean because it's going to take a while to get back into it it won't all happen at once but um yeah elizabeth is giving a a, a plea for the shower <laughs> well done elizabeth <laughs> <laughs> uh, um uh, jack you had a brief aside about um speaking about how aslan used music to create the world but also tolkien is there something about this creative experience with music that both of the both of these inklings connected with? What, what what does that look like to you? Well, we don't have to imagine what it was like for them because they both committed to words. I mean, the, in the magician's nephew, we get we get Lewis's beautiful account of the creation of the world, Narnia, um, with music. And I only quoted a couple of small sections from it. It's a long passage and it's so wonderful to read. And I, I recommend reading it out loud. It's just, even if it's just to yourself, it's a beautiful section. But Tolkien also cre had a creation myth um, and it's in the Silmarillion. It's in the opening uh, pages of the Silmarillion um, where he, 
where Iluvatar, uh, Eru, who is the, the god of Middle Earth, mm -hmm. it's God, the father in Middle Earth language, um, he creates Middle Earth through music. And it's actually, in some respects, it's a more detailed uh, expression of how that happens than, than Lewis's. Um, they're both poetic in their own way, but they're very different from each other. And in, one of the interesting contrasts is how um, Lewis focus mo focuses mostly on Aslan and not so much on the other uh, characters in that creation story, although they're there, the stars in particular are, are, are mentioned um, as participating. Uh, Tolkien, right from the get-go, has other actors that God has created and then are given the privilege of, of singing into existence Middle Earth. And as they do that, they are astounded at, at Middle Earth. And uh, when they see, you know, it's kind of a, uh, an incarnation of that line, the angels long to look into these things. You know, you see them actually looking into them and singing them. And then they, and then they also learn, they're, they're also side by side and they hear one another's songs. And they're, and they're amazed at Iluvatar's vision to bring each of these interesting and transcendent characters into, into play and into partnership in, in creating Middle Earth. So if you haven't read uh, Tolkien's creation myth in, in Silmarillion, I urge you to go do it. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, story. Ken Myers of Mars Hill Audio. Mm -hmm. We once appeared on a, on a um, conference together. We were both speaking for the conference and he came up at, to, to Leanne and I in, the, in advance of the, of the talk. And he said, well, I've prepared some stuff to, you know, to say, and I'm going to say it, but I, what I really want to do is read the entire creation myth of Tolkien's to begin, you know, he said, do you think that would be boring for people? And of course he asked the totally wrong people that question. We said, yes, you must do that. I want to hear somebody read that aloud to me. I haven't heard that for a long time. So please go ahead. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> It was fantastic. <laughs> so great. Um, Susan is suggesting that it is also great on Audible. So well done, Susan. That's it's, oh, it's nice to hear. Um, That's Martin Shaw reading it, actually, who who is the lead actor in George Gently, the, the de 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 detective series from England. It's, he's a great actor and he reads it really well. That's great. I, I've got a great question here from Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer asks, is music always about beauty? What about lament? and expressions of trials, temptations, or wrestling? Well, yes, of course. And, and a robust vision of beauty includes lament. It includes the dark and the shadowy side of being human. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just as God is not uh, apart, away from, you know, there's the great verse in uh, Psalm 127, I think it is, he says, if I, if my soul descends into Sheol, you are there. God is completely aware of the, the, the shadow and the dark elements of human experience. And in fact, underwent them himself on the cross in particular, but not only there, um, experienced all that we experience. And so I am not excluding lament. In fact, most of my, most of my music is tinged with a hint of melancholy. Mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that's part of the human experience, a big part of it. And the homesickness that we experience here, the longing for God involves particularly the expression of lament. So uh, I would say that our problem is not that it's not part of, that it shouldn't be part of music. Our, our, our vision of beauty is too narrow. It needs to be a more robust theology of what beauty includes, including lament including those dark things that, that uh, are often not part of our worship experiences, but probably should be. Yes. Yes. I've been thinking a lot of more about lament this year through COVID. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I have the opportunity of being a music director at a, at a liturgical church. And so we do read lament Psalms and we do confess each week, but there is st still more to be explored in how to lament well yeah and the psalms are our, are our model for that there's plenty of lament a lot of lamenting in the psalms and uh and so we shouldn't exclude something that um is there in in the lord's songbook for us you know 
Now, Jack, we've been having lots of questions about the the movies, the BBC production of Nar BBC production of Narnia, the film scores for the um, the three movies that were prepared. Do you have do you have any comments on those movies, the films, the BBC production? Did you like the music? What do you think? Well, I I'm really not. Um... I don't really want to speak about the movies. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd rather be, because I, I didn't particularly enjoy the movies that much. I tend to be a bit of a purist when things that I love are set to, you know, are, are made is, is into films. Um, I had the same issues with The Lord of the Rings. It's not my favorite uh, experiences in the movies. I, I far prefer other other films than those. So I'd rather not talk about the, I, I know the music was well done. Um, because I, I know some of the guys that, uh, that worked on it, but um, I'm not, uh, I don't really want to talk about the movies or the sure. BBC production. It's just, you know. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. There are so many questions and I thought it would be nice to give you a chance to, to just tell us how you felt about them. <laughs> well, I guess I have, haven't I? <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. We're all, we're I mean, I'd, all rather, I'd rather remain with the mystery of the music that I can't quite Get put it into into writing myself that spark that my imagination sparks with from the books themselves directly. I'd rather stay with that than um, than you know look to uh, you know to, uh, an attempt at recreating someone else's vision, someone else's imagination about it. You know, yeah. just the books are the books are too precious to me, and and what my imagination has created for me with those books and with the, the Tolkien books and the Charles Williams books, all of the Inklings, mm -hmm. um, it's just too rich. I don't want to dilute it. That's great. We have a rule in my house that you can't watch the movie until you've read the books with my children. Because I don't want them, you know, imagining Daniel Radcliffe when they read Harry Potter or I don't, because there's something about that first experience when you come up with your own ideas. Yeah. But perhaps I should like put an age limit on it. You have to be 40 before you can watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Maybe not 40. <laughs> Um, our, our friend Terry here has a great question. Um, just thinking about some, some other composers. Who are some contemporary composers that deserve our attention, especially those with a connection to faith? Who are you listening to that you particularly love? Well, I, I was thinking about this because before we went on the air here, um, we were talking about that. And I would say James McMillan is someone I would really recommend. Yeah. His choral music is gorgeous and he has some very bracing and uh, exciting concert music for the orchestra. Um, I love, um, well, my, my friend Roxana Panufnik has written some wonderful music of faith. Um, and I uh, really love her music and, um, oh shoot, my mind is just going blank right now. I know there's some other people. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, composers that, that I listen to. And I tend not to, I tend not to have per particular in one favorite. I tend to think in terms of groups of mm. people, but um, yeah, I listen to, I listen to a lot of contemporary music um, and it's a pretty wide swath of, of, of composers. Right. But, right. I mean, I, the people that I go back to time and time again, I listen to a lot of early music. I go back to Thomas Tallis and William Byrd, uh, De La Sous, um, and then I listen to uh, Shostakovich and Stravinsky. And 20th century composers are particularly favorites of mine. I like um, Benjamin Britten and Ray Fun Williams from England and Gerald Finzi. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these, these are not necessarily contemporary living composers right now, but um, gosh, I'm, I'm I know I'm blanking and leaving out somebody that I should be mentioning. Oh, Chris, Chris Howell says, don't forget Messian. Oh, Messian, yeah. Quartet for the end of time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> well, I got a story about that. I, I, I was orchestrating for Randy Newman yeah. and uh, I went out to his house to, to work on it. And um he's got a wall full of scores in his house. I mean, just a huge wall full of classical scores in bookcases. And uh, 
So he had to go out for a minute while we were well, while we were talking, while we were meeting, and I just kind of was perusing the scores and looking through them. And they weren't like just Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven. He had Messiaen's Tarangalila Symphony, which is this massive, really esoteric and eccentric kind of work. And Wait, um, Randy Newman, the guitar player. Randy Newman, the the songwriter, the guy yeah. who wrote Toy Story, the score. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Going. Yeah, really, really great guy. And he has this score in his bookshelf. And I pulled it out. And when he came back and I says, Randy, I can't believe you have this score. This is amazing. He goes, oh, yeah. The woodwinds at bar 109 are really interesting. And, you know, and I went, wow. And, and he said, yeah, I'm pretty much finished with it if you want to take it. So I have Randy Newman's score for the Tarangalila Symphony sitting in my bookshelf now. <laughs> claim to fame. That's your claim to fame. Oh, my goodness. That's so great. <laughs> Jack, I've got two questions for you, uh, a short one and a longer one. Uh, my short one is from Jennifer. Do you have a favorite film score that particularly complements or synergizes with the story? Is there something that you just found really masterful? Oh, yeah. Yeah, lots of them. I have a hard time picking favorites, but I would have to say that Vertigo is high among them. It's one of my favorite films and it's one of my favorite scores. Okay. I have not seen it, so that's going to go on my list. Alfred Hitchcock, Vertigo with James Stewart, yeah. Yeah, it's old, right? 60s? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, can I find it some, never mind, I'll go look for it. <laughs> yeah, find. It's easy to find, it's classic. <laughs> Jack, my last question for you is, is maybe, uh, maybe something longer you can speak to, but how has your faith journey um, informed you as a musician? You know, you, you work a lot in Hollywood and Hollywood folks you've particularly taken a journey and I forgot to tell people at the beginning about your book. If you would like to learn more about Jack, look at that old picture. Look at how <laughs> handsome you are in both times. So great. If you'd like to learn more about Jack's journey, he's got a wonderful um, uh, biography here or autobiography. I never know the, if you memoir. wrote it. <laughs> memoir, Ooh, even better. So tell us about how your faith impacts uh, what you do every day. Yeah, that's kind of like asking, well, how does air impact your daily uh, experience? <laughs> you know, um, it is so woven into the into the heart of my experience, and um, I, it, you know, I I find it hard to separate it out. Um, but there are a few things that I can talk about. I mean, I think um, you know it changes your perspective. It changes my perspective about about things that. Uh, are sort of the prevailing assumptions about what life is like. Working in Hollywood, there are a lot of prevailing assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the success, the uh, kind of uh, the theology of success is something that's antithetical to, the, to a theology of grace. Mm -hmm. A success-based worldview is completely different than a grace-based worldview. Um, in a success-based worldview, your, your mistakes are failures. In a grace-based worldview, your mistakes are opportunities um, to learn. Um, there's different currencies, you know, in Hollywood. Hollywood is driven by money, of course, but it's also driven by um, power, uh, you know, the, this idea of respect. Most, most people in Hollywood don't just want to make money. They also want the respect of their peers. I mean, witness all the awards shows. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a very different worldview than, than one that um, asks you to think of others more highly than yourself, you know, that think, asks you to divest yourself of your, of your, your um, privileges and, and the things that, uh, the powers that you've been, you're granted. And you, you have to set those at the foot of the cross if you want to have a fulfilling life. Um, even the idea of a fulfilling life is interpreted differently through a success-based worldview than it is from a grace-based worldview. So these are, you know, vastly different ways of looking at life. And so your perspective is so different. You, you just, I feel like sometimes, sometimes it feels like in Hollywood, I'm greasing the wheels on the train to hell, you know, <laughs> that's a phrase I used to use a lot. I don't actually use it as much anymore because as I've gotten older, my, my um, sense is of, of my, I don't, I break down the distinction between myself and my colleagues. I feel like we're all 
yearning for similar things, you know, and, and we all want to be, want to, to live life well and to know what is at the heart of life. And um, so I don't, you know, I don't think of my colleagues as necessarily being hell bound. I just think of, I just think of us as all being sort of in the same, in the same sea and, you know, they're throwing lifeboats, life, life preservers to us. And some of us get them, you know, 10 seconds before the next guy does, you know? Um, yeah. So um, it helps me, you know, I think of Eric Little's phrase in Chariots of Fire, when I run, I feel his pleasure. When I write music, I feel his pleasure. It's the way I can run. Um, it affects every note I've ever written. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like my prayer when I'm writing music, that form of prayer is some of the deepest prayer I engage in. Um, the choices that I have to make in, in terms of what note follows the last one, mm -hmm. they're, they're all informed by this huge enveloping thing, which is a relationship with the God who made me and, and made me to love music and made me to write it. And, you know, other people do different other things and, and we all do different things. And in, in, in Lewis's perspective, every one of those things is necessary for God to be completely praised as he ought to be that each one of us has a particular way of praising him yeah. for mine. It's for me, it's music. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And we're so grateful that you have run in this direction and followed the Lord in this way. Thank you, Jack, for your time today. Thank you. I wish we had more time because it seems like there's, I, I can see in the chat <laughs> section <laughs> down there's a lot of questions and I wish well, we had more time to talk. It would be fun. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully you'll come to Oxbridge and you normally, you usually do. So we've got um, plans for that for the summer of 2022. Yes, please come to Oxbridge in 2022. That'll be great. It'd be great to yes. see you. Friends, we're so glad that you have joined us today. Come in a in a in a month and um, hear from Brett. Do buy his book in the meantime. Uh, it'll be great to get some perspective and background as to what he'll be speaking with us about. Let me pray. Um, I want I want to pray a prayer from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer about uh, it's for church musicians and artists, but I think this can be applicable for all of us and particularly for Jack as he works. I want to pray a blessing on him and his continued composition, which blesses us and so many people um, in the amazing areas that he works. Um, and for those of you who may be creatives or struggling to be creative, a writer, an, an artist, a musician, a poet, a someone who works with clay, a potter. <laughs> and there are so many ways in which we uh, create and are co-creators uh, co with the Lord. So let's pray together. O God, whom saints and angels delight to worship in heaven, be ever present with your servants on earth who seek through art and music to perfect the praises of your people. Grant them even now true glimpses of your beauty and make them worthy at length to behold it unveiled forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, I pray that as you go forth this day and into this week, that you will feel the Lord's pleasure as you run. We at the C.S. Lewis Foundation are so grateful for our sponsors, uh, Preservation of Elegance, G. Uh, Wesley, Mr. and Mrs. Wesley Vic III and Joshua George. We'll see you next month. <laughs>